and CFR's YouTube channel. Thank you. I think those are just there to tell us where to sit. <laughs> okay, thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, good morning, I'm Sebastian Malaby. I work here at the council. Uh, next to me I have Louis Alexander from Nomura, Jillian Tett, uh, US Managing Editor of the Financial Times, and the tireless fellow over there is Vincent Reinhardt. Um, I thought when I saw Vincent that it must be that having watched the populist vote come out in strength in Iowa, you know, that fury against tie-wearing individuals. Um, you're kind of going with the flow. Uh, but Vincent has a, a story that he swears by that, you know, he went to a restaurant, he gave them one suitcase. Yeah. At the end of the meal, he gave them the other one. <laughs> he didn't somehow notice. He wakes up in a hotel room. It's the wrong suitcase. There's no tie in it. We, we, we believe it. We, we, do, we do believe it. Um, uh, the clothes were better, actually. But, but it felt wrong to ruffle through the... Uh... Um, so, uh, in many of these World Economic Update uh, discussions, um, we kind of go around the world and discuss uh, different regions on, on their own terms. But I feel like the last month, uh, despite a good day for the markets on Friday, uh, has been unusually the case of one where everything is sort of knit together, that global markets are responding to three kinds of worry. Uh, the oil price, the China uh, uncertainty, and uh, the debate around the Fed's uh, potential next moves and, and the US outlook. Um, and what strikes me also is that if one was to play devil's advocate a little bit, each of these things uh, would appear to be sort of exaggerated fears. So uh, China has real issues, but the government has enormous ammunition. Uh, to deal with them. Uh, oil is supposed to be a uh, low oil price, has winners and losers, but there are winners, so why is it such a big deal? Uh, at the Fed, we're talking about, you know, will it be tightening by 25 basis points, 75, but the, the magnitude doesn't seem on its face to be big enough. So I guess the question I want to get at uh, bit by bit in this discussion is whether there's an overreaction. Um, we're going to start with oil, and we're going to start with uh, uh, Gillian. Um, so Gillian, the standard view would be that a lower oil price would be cause for economic worry uh, if what you've got is basically weak demand, because of course weak demand would be a symptom of broader issues. But it seems to me that in this case, supply, um, uh, strong supply, is at least sort of three quarters of the, of the issue, whether it's uh, the failure at OPEC to agree on output restrictions, Iran rejoining the market, shale and so on. Uh, what's your take on this? Why is this weak oil price uh, upsetting markets so much? Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you for having me along today. I feel a bit of a fraud because as a journalist, I'm used to asking the questions and hiding behind rude qu questions rather than having to actually answer them myself. Um, but when I look at the oil price, what I see is not just an oil price, but the oil price as a symbol for the fact that when you try and make sense of what's happening in the world today, economics is not just about economics and not just about numbers. In particular, I think we need to recognize when we try to make sense of what's spooking investors, we need to recognize that we have to join up any macroeconomic analysis with finance and macroeconomics with politics. And that sounds like an incredibly obvious thing to do is something that was widely forgotten pre-2007. And even today, I think many investors are pretty um, un unprepared for doing it um, in its totality. And by that, I mean two things. When you try and work out why a low oil price is spooking investors, it's partly because 
We've replaced a Western credit bubble, subprime mortgage bu uh, bu bubble if you like, with a second bubble created by the central banks, QE, which essentially much of that money went not into the West but went into the emerging markets. And what we're seeing now is that bubble begin to implode. The fact it's coincided with weak oil prices is putting a lot of pressure on a lot of emerging market countries. And so those two issues are wrapped up in the minds of many investors when they look at what's going on. So people aren't just fretting about low oil prices, they're fretting about the knock-on impact on a number of countries, whether it's Russia, Nigeria, Brazil, etc., etc. Um, and secondly, when you look at the oil price, oil price has always been about politics and unpredictable policy making and fantastically opaque policy making in terms of OPEC. The only thing that's worse than an opaque cartel is an opaque cartel that's breaking down at a time of great geopolitical uncertainty when nobody's in charge. And that, coupled with the oil price, I think, is one of the reasons why this is spooking investors. So key point is, we've, I read a book recently about silos, so apologies for plugging it, but we have to get out of our silo thinking. We have to recognize that economics, finance, and politics is very, very tightly entwined right now in a way that most investors are not used to trying to analyze. And the oil price is a really a fundamental symbol of that nasty trifecta that we're trying to get our heads around. So, Lewis, the way I hear Gillian's answer is sort of, in a way, uh, confirming of my um, hypothesis, which is that um, there's a lot of mood music, a lot of politics around the oil price, which is spooking people. But the oil price shift in and of itself doesn't logically lead. Uh, it creates uncertainty. But, it, but you, you've argued at these meetings before that there is a sort of time thing here where investment crashes by oil producers faster and consumption picks up. Um, is that what we're seeing? So, yeah, let me say a couple things about that. First of all, when you, when you talk about the oil price is supply, it's not demand, I think you have to distinguish two things. The fact that we're talking about numbers in the 30s as opposed to $100, which is where we were a year and a half ago, that's clearly predominantly a supply issue. But if you look forward and ask the question, what is actually going uh, to sort of establish the new floor, it's the interaction between supply and demand going forward. We're in a situation now where the world is producing more oil than it's consuming. And the basic question going forward is, what is the process that's going to bring that back into balance? And that is going to be some demand, and it's going to be some on the supply side. And so I think this, this question is about sort of what's going on in the emerging world, and that growth story is very much a part of that, even though in a broader sense, yeah, we're dealing with a supply shock. So that's one thing. Second of all, I do think when you think about the benefits and, and costs of lower oil prices, you do have to think about the decline in investment that's associated with a much lower oil price. We have seen um, a collapse in drilling activity in the United States. We've seen pullbacks in major development projects sort of around the world, anywhere where those are producers. That has happened, I think, much more quickly than people expected. And in many ways, the downdrafts from that, I would argue, have been stronger than the benefits from lower prices for consumers. I would argue very strongly for the US that lower oil prices last year was a negative for the US economy. I think that is going to be, continue to be the case through the first half of this year. It works partly through what's going on domestically. It works part, partly through our exports to places like Canada. Now, obviously, if you're, if you're talking about um, someplace like Europe, where it doesn't really have the domestic production side, it's a bit of a different story. One of the puzzles, I would argue, of the last year and a half is the fact that even those places that are purely, it's purely the ought to benefit from it, those effects don't seem very large. Um, and I think there is a bit of a puzzle there. But uh, I don't think it's that hard to sort of explain sort of the role of, of oil in this world. So, Vincent, I guess part of what Luz is saying is that there's a timing thing where investment reacts much faster. But there's also a debate, I think, about how um, the old wisdom on oil was that when you shift, when you have a transfer through lower prices from producers to consumers, uh, the consumers spend the windfall uh, more than, than uh, the, the effect that the elasticity is bigger on the consumption side. That may be changing, I think, with producers um, who used to maybe smooth the effect of a low oil price by spending down savings. They don't have that much in the way of savings anymore to spend down. Sovereign wealth funds are being liquidated rather quickly. Uh, Saudi Arabia's budget presupposes an enormously high oil prices to break even. 
So in other words, there is a reduction in demand uh, from this lower oil price uh, that offsets the increase from consumers. Well, what you're saying is base effects matter. And if your rule of thumb was generated somewhere in the mid 80s or the mid 90s, it, it doesn't quite apply to when the US is such a large producer. And that gets you the temporal effects that yes, on net consumers benefit from lower energy prices, it's a reduction in an excise tax. But by and large, when you look at the incidence of that tax, it is on uh, lower income households who are basically hand to mouth consumers. They're not going to benefit from that too. They actually have to spend less at the pump. Well, they actually don't spend less at the pump until the middle of the driving season and, and you know, in, in the middle of the year. Um, the producers in the U.S. in particular uh, are more forward looking or they're more, they're forced to be forward looking by their sources of funding. And an important aspect of the contraction that Lewis noted was exactly that credit got harder to get if you were, a, you know, you were a, a, an oil producer. Uh, the other aspect to recognize is, you know, in the discussion, is this supply or is this demand? We don't know either. And it's reasonable when you see a big change in price to impute some to both. And so part of the reaction is, okay, it's probably supply, but does this actually tell us that China's weaker than we thought? And that's more important in spook and markets than, than, than the effect on the price itself. Go ahead, Julian. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to trying to look at the, micro, uh, the macro level implications in a country like the US, both on consumers and producers, um, you know, I think there's a crying need to do right now what wasn't done in the last credit bubble, which is to get out, wear out the shoe, shoe leather, and go and look on the ground at what's actually happening in terms of changing patterns of behavior. Because I think the question about the degree to which consumers are or are not willing to spend a cash windfall, given the debt overhang, given the memories of what happened in the credit crisis, is fascinating, and I think hasn't been studied enough. But also the question of what the producers are doing right now is fascinating. Um, because if you start digging into what's happening to many of these shale um, oil and gas exploration companies, you know, one thing that may not be incredibly important in this cycle is the fact that a lot of this debt a lot of these bonds were sold with very few covenants. Um, it's very hard to see what's going to be the trigger in some cases for actually creating bankruptcies, the kind of cleansing process you'd normally expect with American capitalism. You may be heading for a world of zombies for quite a while while people you know, st stagger on and where the banks don't actually do anything. Um, and that again could change the equation. I mean that some of the patterns and models seen in earlier cycles aren't quite so applicable this time around. And that raises, I mean, the, the more general question about um, the financial spillover effects from this oil <coughs> price adjustment. I mean, some, some of what may be going on is, is best understood, you know, demand uh, uh, and how it's affected among consumers and producers. But there's just simply portfolio effects where, you know, Saudi Arabia's wealth fund is dumping assets around the world. Malaysia is selling property in London. Um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, high-yield bonds are now yielding a lot. Uh, they're really high-yield. What do you think about these financial spillover effects? So they're notable. They're getting larger. And I think they're at a point where you do have to think about it in terms of the outlook for the global economy. I, I want to stress very, very strongly, though, that this is not 2007 or 2008. Let me, let me, you know, we're seeing a tightening of financial conditions through credit. We have, six months ago, I would have argued it was much more concentrated in the energy sector itself. It has broadened out since then. You're starting to see it in some of the survey measures of credit availability. So say, for example, small businesses are actually reporting that it's harder to get credit. We think that is related to some of the pressures that are coming back on banks. But when it, I, I think when you kind of dig into it and look at the magnitude of these losses, they're material, but they're not things that I think are going to sort of disrupt the system. You bring up the point about sovereign wealth funds, and you're absolutely right that, in some sense, official accumulation of financial assets, whether it be central banks through QE or reserve accumulation by emerging market economies, either directly or through sovereign wealth funds, has been a big deal. And we are going through a period when those things are changing. And that is very much changing, in some sense, that's part of the financial volatility we're dealing with. I think it is going to have an impact on the on the outlook, but I think it's a it's. Well, I, 
I get a little hesitant sometimes when we when we kind of start hearing people talk about it's this is another sort of big financial crisis. I think it's hard for me to get to that. Uh, Jillian, just in terms of how quickly the correction's going on in the U.S., I'm struck by the fact that how quickly the actual production side on the investment is the sort of just look at the drilling activity. Mm -hmm. It's collapsed. And that is, I think, that is something where the real effects of these changes are happening very rapidly. And yeah, it's going to take some time for people, to, the investment bankers, to figure out like how this is all going to go. But I don't think, I, as I look at that sector, I don't think that there's some obstacle to adjustment. Right? If anything, it's, it's happening very quickly, as it should. Um, I guess I'm a little more convinced that it is a supply story as opposed to the way Vince did it, and just in the sense of if you look at, you go back over the last five years and ask where have the surprises been. You know, we, there are forecasts for demand and supply. The, the thing that's sort of been overwhelming is the upward surprises in production in the U.S., right? And that if you, if you go back and ask how is the world different today than people thought it was going to be, the biggest single thing you see that's different is U.S. production is just a lot higher than anybody thought. And I think that affects... And, and OPEC not coordinating. Well, but, but to be perfectly frank, OPEC hasn't been coordinating since 1985. Mm. Like, since right. 1985, I mean, effectively since 1985, it's been Saudi Arabia. Okay. But and Saudi Arabia <coughs> stopped playing well, that role but, in October 2014. But, but partly it was because they looked at what was going on in the U.S. and said, on the one hand, you're seeing... Um, a, a major technological change in the U.S. It's, it's increasing production. <laughs> Potentially that technology has the potential to go other places, number one. Number two, you're also seeing the whole climate debate happen. And if you're sitting there on Saudi Arabia with the most reserves in the world, you're asking yourself the question, like, what are these re reserves really going to be worth over the long run? And so it's, it, yeah, there are a bunch of things that are going on. Um, I think it is more, I don't think of it as an OPEC question. I think it's a, what is Saudi Arabia's strategic perspective, which is not, I think of that as different than from Which is OPEC not just an economic policy question, it's also a foreign policy sure. question. And, and my only point was, we don't know anything about demand, and so therefore it's reasonable to, to wonder about demand in an environment when you see such a significant uh, change in sure. price. And I, going forward, that's yeah. it's very so. Important. So Carmen, Carmen, and a co-author and I for the for the most recent American Economic uh, uh, Association papers and proceedings looked at 200 years of capital flows. And what we want to emphasize is this really is a double bust we're living through. It's not just that commodity prices have weakened and not just oil prices. It is many commodity prices. But emerging markets are getting less capital inflows. Yeah. And the best predictor of subsequent sovereign defaults is a double bust when commodity prices greater and capital inflows stop. Which that comes back to my point that basically it is a trifecta of finance, economics, and politics which are basically crystallizing around the oil price that make it so unnerving for investors. But can I just make one other point following on from Vince's point, which is that, um, you know, it's going to be the unpredictable contagion effects that really create shocks this time around. So the fact that sovereign wealth funds are selling assets all over the place in some surprising ways is one of the areas that's creating ricochet effects through the markets. <coughs> Secondly, of course, to hammer home, home a point that bankers keep making, the market structures have changed significantly since 2007, partly because of regulation. We don't have market makers in the markets to the same degree. The potential for volatility and crowded exits is incredibly high, and that could add to the sense of um, unexpected shocks ricocheting through the markets and creating more contagion. Let's, let's move to China. Um, the second thing which um, uh, I think has been spooking markets a lot in the last, in the last month. Um, Lewis, in the past, you've said at meetings like this that you fully expected uh, in the course of your career to deal with a um, financial crisis that starts in China and goes worldwide, but that you didn't expect it quite this soon. Um, do you still think it's not here yet? Uh, my base case would be that, yes. I, don't, I still would argue, as bad as, as bad as the adjustment is there, the financial system is still fully backed by the government. I think you have to make a judgment about what the fiscal capacity of the government is relative to potential losses. 
I still think that suggests that they have enough to control this and that this isn't the moment for that to happen. Having said that, there's no question the risks have gone up and I don't say that, I, I don't feel that as strongly as I would have felt um, earlier and I think it's, it's something to watch. Look, I think it's the transition that China's going through is, is a, a very, 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 very important one. Obviously, it's just slower growth, but it's also the composition of that growth. So a lot of the weakness in commodity prices is related to the fact that not only is China growing slower, but it's growing, it, it intends to grow in a way that is less resource intensive, and that has these very broad implications. And I would argue a big part of what financial markets are dealing with is just getting used to the notion that we used to have a world where China was growing, you know, eight to 10 percent in, in a way that was very resource intensive. We're transitioning to a world where those growth rates are going to be notably lower and realistically looking forward, there are going to be, you know, we think they're going to be sort of rounds to six uh, this year but going lower. You just sort of do the math on those things and it, it makes a big difference on long-term asset prices and I think markets are going to take a while to get used to that. You add to the fact that it's not just China, it's the fact that potential growth pretty much everywhere you look, with the possible exception of India, is slower. It's demographics, it's productivity, and, it, and in addition to that, you've got the Fed that has tried to transition the U.S. from having grown faster than potential to growing potential. I think you've got an environment where things are slowing for a whole host of reasons, and markets are having trouble figuring out exactly how to go from the old world to the new. So Gillian Lewis's base case is still that China doesn't get into more of a crisis. I guess one um, set of people betting against that are those who are shorting the currency. Mm -hmm. There's been coverage in the FT and elsewhere about Soros and others taking big positions on that. Um, how do you think that ends up? Is this a one-way bet that the speculators win or is it one where the government has the ammunition to squash them? All, dep all depends on your time scale. I mean, you know. Um, in the short term, I think the speculators probably won't win. In the long term, the government has a lot of challenges. And when I look at China, what hits me between the eyes is the parallels between, with Japan in the 1970s and 80s. In the sense that, you know, as with Japan, you have a country which has enjoyed very rapid growth on the back of channeling its financial resources towards <coughs> industry, providing cheap loans for industry at the expense of consumers using essentially a state-controlled financial system, a kind of war-footing economy, if you like, in financial terms. And the economy, as with Japan, has outgrown its financial system. The government has delayed reform <coughs> until far too late. Um, there's some very big, painful transitions to be made, which has started, but right now, China, like Japan, f finds itself in this kind of transition point, this limbo land, where you can neither trust markets as being a good signal of value and pricing, nor can the government control things by fiat anymore and control the price of money simply by ordering things through bureaucratic diktats. So it's kind of in this horrible limbo land. Um, what we saw from, from Japan is that this creates bubbles. It can go on for quite a long time. What we also saw from Japan is that what's very pernicious is not the fact that a bubble bursts. It's when a bubble bursts and you get deflation. I mean, the Japanese financial crisis became very nasty because of deflation. Um, thus far, China doesn't have it um, on an insignificant scale. But if that occurs in the coming years, that's going to be very nasty indeed. Vincent, part of what's going on, it seems, is that the Chinese, if they want to exert control on um, capital outflows, partly driven by their own citizens, need to crunch down politically. Mm -hmm. The more they crunch down politically, the more they incentivize people to want to get money out. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this playing out? Well, that's the problem of... of uh, either interest rate or controlled defenses of the capital flows. It just makes it worse, or it just increases the incentive uh, for the private sector to try even harder to get the capital out, uh, particularly if you see this as, as, as a medium or longer term issue. Look, it's, it's a middle income growth trap for a reason, and that it's very difficult in a controlled system to get as your as you develop a middle class, the middle class wants some control of their own balance sheet and they're restive about corruption. But that's exactly uh, contrary to forced allocation and capital across a big continent. And so 
uh, the very, very tiny tip of a pyramid, that is the officials in China, talking about, you know, 1.3 billion people, uh, have to figure out how to give some measure of control of balance sheets and some economic freedom, freedoms to their burgeoning middle class and still keep in charge. And that's a very difficult transition. I mean, the thing that's fascinating and potentially tragic about China is that I, I would argue never before in human history has a group of policymakers been quite so self-aware and reflective and thoughtful about the parallels of history. I say that, say that because <clears throat> a few years ago I wrote a book about the Japanese financial crisis and the lessons from Japan's history, um, which became a bestseller in China. And it was kind of nice, except for the fact that no one in China actually ever bought the rights. Um, <laughs> it was ent entirely pirated. But hey, it became a bestseller. Um, somebody somewhere benefited. Um, but anyway, a stream of Chinese officials came to see me afterwards asking, well, we've read about, you know, Shinsei Bank, about all these Japanese banks. We've read about the story of the Japanese bubble and why it burst. We can see the parallels. How do we avoid it? And I spoke to official after official after official about the parallels. This was about 10 years ago. And yet the reality is China is where it is today. And so the fascinating question is, you know, with all these super smart Chinese officials who've been educated, you know, in American universities who are so self-aware, so smart, probably some of the most smartest um, policymakers on the planet today, can they actually avoid the crunch? Um, well, I think discouraging people from reading financial history is a very bad idea, Julian. So don't, don't, don't. I'm quite sure the Chinese will pay, pay you for your rights. And if you want to find out how China's growing up, my book, 12, 15, 13 years ago about Japan, basically was pirated and I got no advance at all. The second book, I got a tiny advance, which at least was token, and the third book, I got, you know, a sort of slightly better advance. So China is growing up in terms so of... This is a measure of change in... Uh, <laughs> so there, there's history... I'm sure your advance yeah. will be bigger than mine. The there's family experience on financial history, and, and the one that was relevant is in uh, Carmen, and my wife Carmen and Ken Rogoff's book. Uh, they talk briefly about the default of Japan and immediately got comments from uh, ministry officials, no, we would mm -hmm. never have defaulted. Uh, and, and they, and Carmen just sent a front page of the New York Times from that, you know, snapshot saying, you know, Japan defaults. Uh, there's just a different understanding of history, mm. uh, you know, in, in, in the two. Uh, but there's also just a question of, again, yes, they are the smartest, the well-educated, self-referential and, and all those, but it is the top, the tiny, tiny top of a pyramid. They're trying to manage the biggest rural to urban transfer of, of people in world history. That is hard to do, and you don't necessarily uh, uh, control that. And in some sense, I think the concerns about equity prices in China is a part just how much are officials really in control. Yes. Um, I don't know the answer to Jillian's question, but, but let me give you a perspective of an outside forecaster. The thing that makes it so hard is I do not understand the governance system. So, I mean, the, the inherent problem is I, I think we've all had contact with very smart Chinese in one form or another. The problem is, as I look at the place, I don't understand how it works. I don't understand how they make their decisions. And if they are going to open up the system to more market forces, which effectively is what they're doing, they are going to be subject to this problem, right? It is, and the inevitable aspect of financial crises, which is they are transitions from a period of confidence to adverse selection, where you go from thinking you understand it and kind of going, this all looks good, to, oh my God, it's not what I thought it was. At that moment, like the crucial question is, how quickly can you get to the point where you feel you understand what you're dealing with? So in my experience with emerging market crisis, the critical moment is, when can you credibly define the downside? Like when do you get confidence that you know enough that you know how bad this could be? The problem in China is because we, I do not understand the process of how they make decisions, the data questions, look, economic measurement is always hard. It's particularly hard in an economy that's changing. But they face this problem that as long as things are going well, it's kind of okay. But at some point, we're all gonna have to look at this in a very hard way 
and ask ourselves, we're going to have to get comfortable that we understand what the downside is. But and it's going to be very hard to do. Coming from, you know, Nomura Securities, um, you know, remember back to the 1980s, 1990s uh, in Japan, enigma of Japanese power. People thought they knew yep. roughly how Japan worked, and then suddenly that was ripped apart, and that added to the sense of crisis. So, so a very fat book called The Enigma of Japanese Power, which uh, many people bought and a few people read, um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one opaque system, China another one. But the Fed, just to quickly segue and get to that before we open up um, for, for questions, um, you know, the Fed has made a big um, effort to be more transparent, more open, more readable, and yet the grammar and syntax of the Fed's uh, decisions have been, you know, parsed and I'm not sure it really delivers the certainty that, <coughs> that people expected, uh, this big communications experiment. Um, who, maybe you'll go to Vincent for this. Um, uh, I guess the question here is, um, are people uh, overreacting uh, to, to, this, to the, the, the speculation around the Fed seems to drive markets when we're talking about 25 basis points either way? Um, markets are chasing their own tails. Uh, so do you feel well served by the increased transparency of the Fed uh, and, and the fact that uh, in, in typical FOMC statement now reads at the, at where you need a graduate level education to, to understand it? Uh, I mean, that, that, that's a big issue. I think more than anything um, is the sense that Federal Reserve officials really are sincere when they say all decisions are data dependent and made meeting by meeting. Uh, they don't want to contract to a path for interest rates because the world's too uncertain and that markets react uh, in, in ways that are not, not consistent with sustaining financial stability when you contract to a path for rates. So they're out there saying all decisions are data dependent. They are made meeting by meeting. But an important thing to remember is Newton's law. A body at rest stays at rest. A body in motion stays at motion. They waited a long time at the zero lower bound, probably overstaying the, the time at the zero lower bound, because it's hard for a group to come to the decision that let's all, let's all decide to, to, to raise rates. They had to be completely convinced. Once they're completely convinced, it means there's probably a little bit of catch up to do. They, they understand that they waited a little too long. And that same process of having entered a tightening regime makes it hard to decide to stop the tightening regime. So I, so I think the short answer is markets probably have overreacted to the sense that the, the Fed won't raise rates anytime soon. Uh, they're in a tightening regime. and so they have to be convinced not to raise rates. And that's a higher hurdle. Um, I'm ready to go to the floor, but if you want to, I, I want to give both of you a chance to say something about the Fed if you would like to. Yeah. I just want to say one thing briefly, which is another way of saying what Vincent has expressed, is that the Fed has tried to be both data dependent and time dependent over the last couple of years. And many markets have been acting as if they hoped that it could do that i.e. say it's going to depend on the data, but actually it raise rates within a certain time frame. Um, and that's clearly impossible if you don't know what the data is going to say. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah, financial right. market participants are way more needy than the <laughs> economists at the Federal Reserve are willing to, pro to provide. Yeah. It's like a bunch okay. of teenage So, teenage so with, with that, I want to invite um, uh, members to join the conversation. Just a reminder that this is on the record, so if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. And if you don't, I've got some more. Uh, yes, I can see one right over there, Jeff. Jeff but microphone's just coming. Yep. Jeff Schaefer. Uh, let's focus a little more on the, on the U.S. And for three or four years now, productivity growth's been running about a half a percent. Are you in the camp of people who think it's going to turn up reasonably, or are we going to live with this... Uh, for quite a while, and what do you see as the implications for the course of the economy and inflation? Who wants to crack? Um, I'll take a go. Um, I'm of the view that the best way of forecasting productivity is as a, is as a random walk. Uh, <laughs> um, we don't. We have a we have a lousy record of forecasting these things. I suppose another way to say it is if you look back over the last sort of 50 years, over which we have the best data. 
there really have been two regimes. There's been a kind of high regime and a low regime, and what we really do is we seem to bounce back <laughs> and forth occasionally between them. But we don't really have a very good understanding of, of how we bounce back and forth between those two regimes. And in that context, I'm reasonably pessimistic. I don't see a particularly good reason to expect it to go up. The conundrum really is, you know, we kind of live in this world where uh, there's obviously a lot of technological change going on, and why doesn't it show up in the numbers? Um, I, that is a complicated question. I'm pretty convinced that we're not missing a lot of income. So there's, there's obviously lots of complicated measurement issues. I don't think it's that there's a lot of income being generated that we're not capturing, which means if there is a mismeasurement, it's between the split between prices and real quantities. And it may well be that there's actually more real, there's more real, act, real, act, real stuff being produced and, and less inflation than we thought. But when you kind of dig into that, it's hard to, it's hard to really nail that one down in a way, a way that feels compelling. Look, the bottom line is we aren't generating tremendous nominal income growth. Um, and uh, I think that's a problem. And I, I do think it affects how I think about a whole host of things. Potential output, where interest rates are going. It affects things like how you should think about long-run fiscal issues because it kind of pushes you in that uh, lower trajectory. So I, I do think it's a very important issue. The people who are more optimistic, um, it certainly could happen that we could switch back to the high regime. Um, uh, it's no particular reason to believe that that's impossible. I just don't see a particularly good reason to, exp to think that that's the most likely thing that's going to happen. A few months back, we, we, we had uh, Hal Varian, the chief economist of Google here. And I think the thing which emerged from his visit was partly that uh, technology creates consumer surplus, which is different from products that you sell for money. And so you get a lot of benefits to consumers that don't show up in any of these data, productivity or otherwise. It's still doing people good. But Julian. No, I was going to say that's absolutely, absolutely the case. And frankly, the productivity statistics should be stapled or pinned to the desk of every single economist and journalist right now as a reminder of just how little we actually know about what's happening in the grassroots of the economy in terms of um, you know, these technological impact on the data. But there's another factor which the BIS has recently been looking into. And Claudio Borio, the chief economist there, put out a very interesting paper recently looking at the impact of the financial crisis and the kind of hangover effect. And if you were looking for any reason why productivity may possibly begin to pick up in the coming years, it's that as this financial crisis effect starts to recede, some of the distortion that was created from the financial crisis on the productivity data may begin to fall out. Possibly. You don't agree. But I, 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 I've thought about that question for the US. And there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of work, very good micro work, that's looked at. Can you, can you understand what's going on in the US? And I think the financial <laughs> channel is one that people have looked at. And it's hard to make the case, I think, um, uh, on the US side that, that's, that that feels very important. And one of the things that's, that's striking to me is the US economy is much less dynamic than it used to be. If you, if you go back over <coughs> 25 years, the, just sheer the level of turnover sort of call it creative destruction, was much higher. And that declined into the crisis. And um, that is not a result of the crisis. That is something that was happening before. And so I think there are sort of a broader set of things that are going on that are, that are kind of hard to explain. Another interesting thing that's sort of related is there's a, a nice paper that was done at the board um, that just simply looked at the non-financial corporate sector and asked whether or not the non-financial corporate sector was a net user or provider of funds back into the savings and investment system. And the interesting result was that things seemed to change around 2001, again, well before the crisis, where before that, the non-financial corporate sector was a net user of funds, which is kind of what you'd expect. Since then, they've been a net provider of funds. Um, it's not just the US, it's a global phenomenon. It's another one of these things that I think is related to sort of global savings and investment balances. It's related to why interest rates are where they are. But it's partly it's telling you that the investment opportunities that the non-financial corporate sector sees are perhaps not as great as you might think, or they're different. So I am, I am struck by the difference between, say, Uber and the automobile industry. Right? When people invented automobiles, you had to do a lot of real investment yeah. to sort of realize the idea. 
Uber, everybody already had a smartphone, they already had a car, right? You didn't, you created this incredible business without actually doing any much real investment. And I think that is a better model for the kind of the world we live in, but it, it, it has to do with the nature of innovation today is kind of not generating the same kinds of things it has in the past. But that should be making the world more productive, not less. Yeah, right. no, I mean, oh, absolutely. We, we get technological innovation in the industries that don't use a whole lot of capital. And yeah. therefore, they don't generate the demands for goods, even as they're making more goods. But yeah. the first thing you're supposed to you know, teach in the very first uh, macro course is GDP isn't welfare. Uh, right. that, and so that the fact that we don't measure it well uh, doesn't necessarily mean people aren't living better. But by the way, if it is the fact that we're producing more output than the statistics suggest, then the Fed is even shorter of its goal of price stability uh, because it means that prices are, are increasing a, a, a lot less. And, and it isn't just the US experience. We yep. started talking about China, but you, know, you look at the IMF's World Economic Outlook, six out of seven of the countries have had their, uh, the, their forecast of potential output growth marked down over the la last couple of years. And I, I agree with Lou, Ruth, Julian, we have no idea what productivity is, is doing. Uh, there are different regimes, it's hard to measure, but we're a lot more confident about demographics. Mm. And demographics are generally turning adverse. Another question maybe. Yes, yes. Otherwise, I will ask one. I have one, actually, which is, oh, okay, I see one here, okay. Um, Michelle Smith, uh, this time last year, we were reading a lot of concern that emerging markets had reached peak reserves. This year, we're reading a lot of concern about um, commodity prices and also about uh, capital outflows. How much comfort do you take from emerging markets, foreign reserves? Um, and, and their state and their uh, ability to provide resilience to the challenges that emerging markets face right now? Uh, so I have three quarters trillion dollars less comfort this year than I would have at the same time last year because foreign reserves can get blown through and, that, and that's what we learned in, in 2015. Uh, Carmen and I and a co-author just, just finished a paper that noted that the accumulation of foreign foreign reserves across emerging markets is also associated with a slowing in capital investment. So if you accumulate safe assets, i.e. you know, uh, official investments, you are crowding out something, and that is productive capital. You know, uh, productive uh, capital. So uh, emerging market economies are in a better position than they were. I don't think there's any question, you know, it, 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 you know, the, the stock of reserves is a buffer, but you can blow through that buffer pretty quickly, and that buffer's costly. So, so Lewis, wait, let me frame the question. Which way do you think the system is going to evolve? Because we've had this iteration where after the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s, emerging markets responded by massive reserve accumulation to self-insure because they didn't want to do a suhato and go cap in hand to the IMF uh, and then have a revolution. Okay, so they, they accumulate enormous reserves. Most people say, too much reserves. What do they need all these reserves for? And now we observe that in some cases, it looks as if they can be blown through and they might not actually have been enough. So in the next iteration, do people just accumulate even more reserves in places like Brazil or Russia? Or, or what happens? Uh, so I, I guess I'm not at the point where I would conclude that they're not enough. Um, I look at a country like Brazil that, as we've sort of said already, is facing kind of a historic challenge, right? A, a, a significant, a historically significant change in the terms of trade. So Brazil is a kind of commodity-driven country and it's facing like a incredibly serious domestic political crisis. Like I did my dissertation on the Latin debt crisis and I've kind of followed it over the years. Frankly, if you would have told me, you know, major, major political crisis and generational negative terms of trade shock and asked me what would have had happened to Brazil, I would not have said, well, the debate is kind of, is the real going to be 420 or is it going to be 470, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, Brazil's having a recession. It's a difficult time, but it's, it is night and day from the crisis we've seen in the past. And that is every much a, a function of the fact that they have a tremendous amount more reserves. So the federal government is a net creditor 
in foreign exchange as opposed to a net debtor, which it always was before. And so I think we're in a much, much better place, as, as kind of Vincent said. Now, there are limits to this, and, and one of the things that's striking is the financial overhang around the reserves has grown tremendously. When we were kind of thinking about this in the wake of the Asian <coughs> financial crisis and we were kind of advocating for, gee, countries ought to hold more reserves, I, we had no idea we were going to get the magnitude of the numbers we've in fact seen. And it is challenging in an environment where the financial kind of infrastructure around it has kind of grown up as well. We've also had this incredible increase in domestic financial intermediation in these countries, which is the thing that sort of generates my, the biggest concern for me. So the fact that you've seen this very rapid increase in the domestic financial systems in all these countries is a vulnerability that you know, we certainly didn't anticipate within that respect. Look, I, it's hard to argue, I, I think it's hard for me to imagine that the reserve levels are gonna get notably higher than the peaks we've already seen. I just think it doesn't make sense, but I do think and, but I do think it buys you a lot of resilience. Um, but ultimately, you're going to sort of have to think through these sort of other, other vulnerabilities. But I, I, I guess I'm, I'm still of the, of the view that we're a, we're a significant way from like choke points we've seen in the past. If the reserves aren't big enough, then the most natural um, next step will be capital controls. And one of the interesting sort of 10-year questions is that if we do end up with an emerging market crisis in the next year or two, which is particularly nasty, and if it turns out that having capital, having huge reserves has not been good enough, will we, over a 10-year horizon, see a return to more, um, more intrusive capital controls um, going forward? It, the answer is, I think, almost certainly yes, because it also aligns well with the fact that so many advanced economies have large levels of government debt capital controls are also associated with financial repression. And the reason I didn't put a much, much like Lewis in terms of in a better position is, uh, as Lewis, Lewis notes, uh, there is a lot of financial private sector activity surrounding what governments are doing and private sector mistakes become public sector obligations at a time of stress. And, and, and that's, that's a big risk. And that in turn, though, again, I'm being journalists asking questions, but raises the other question was, you know, was 2007, if we look back in 10 years' time, will we look back and conclude that 2007 was a high tide mark, high water mark for globalization? Uh, as <laughs> 1913 was in retrospect, I think is sort of the... Oh. Well, I'll keep asking the that's question if you can ask That's extreme. That's extreme. A uh, question over there. That was adding to the question. Yeah. <laughs> Arthur Rubin. Uh, just to follow up on the thread of conversation you've been having, how would a out-and-out -out default by a major parastatal company, and I'm thinking Pedevesa or Petrobras, less likely Pemex, play into that equation? How does that change the dynamic both on the sovereign side and more broadly in the way that the rest of the world looks at putting capital into emerging markets? I'm looking at the man with the dissertation under his belt. <laughs> um, that you all have dissertations, but I mean the, the relevant <laughs> dissertation. Yeah, um, mine's on Tajik wedding rituals. So, yeah. um, <laughs> Tajik wedding rituals. Yeah. Um, so look, I, I, something like that would be a major shock to the system. I think it would be something that would lead to sort of further withdrawals in capital. On the other hand, it would depend a lot on how it's managed. I think one of the challenges you face with any sort of state-owned company is where is the line, right? Is this sovereign or is it not? In most of the kind of emerging market debt crisis, one of the crucial issues has always been, like as sort of Vincent suggests, right? At what point does stuff that might be considered private become public or not? I think there's always been this sort of question of when can you kind of try and impose discipline by allowing somebody to actually go broke, right? I mean, there was a, um, and that's always a tricky question. If it comes in an environment where the whole system doesn't look fragile, there's a strong argument to be made that, gee, you ought to let things go, have some sort of bankruptcy process and let it work. The challenge is always knowing like how resilient the system is going to be to that. At the moment, you know, my guess is, um, 
people are going to want to, things would have to get pretty bad for people to believe that that's the, the that you would want to let that go at this moment. Um, but on the other hand, I don't, you know, I'm not, my impression is we're not that close to that at this point. But it is, uh, those are going to be tough policy choices. Um, at the moment, I wouldn't feel like the spillovers would be so horrendous from that, but that's a tough call. It's also known as the Lehman question, uh, um, <laughs> which going into it looked easier than coming out of it. And I yep. think the short answer is we'd say, geez, they didn't have as much reserves as we thought they did. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, will, it, would be a, it would be a test. It would be a test of all emerging markets because the, the shock isn't just country specific, it is a, an asset class. But can I add to that and say one of the things that caused the chaos of the Lehman Brothers collapse was the fact that investors in London woke up overnight and discovered that the legal framework surrounding the treatment of investor assets with Lehman Brothers, particularly between London and New York, was completely untested, unclear and wasn't what they expected. So to extrapolate from that, I think one of the key questions everyone should be asking right now in relation to both sovereign bankruptcy and quasi-sovereign bankruptcy is, is there actually a clear-cut legal framework in place that people can trust, which will clarify what happens to investor assets and creates waterfall structures? And what's quite alarming to my mind is that on the sovereign bankruptcy stage, there's a crying need right now for a faster workout process and more clarity. I mean, the Argentinian government's going to finally, finally, finally meet with mediators this week in New York to talk about this, but heaven knows that's taken long enough. If you look at Puerto Rico right now, that is a complete and utter total mess. So it's not just the economic fallout of any potential bankruptcy, it's a potential for legal uncertainty and lack of clarity and um, new precedents to be set. And let's hope that somebody starts to try and clarify this before we actually get the crunch. Well, so the good right. news is we're waiting for the Brazilian courts to... Uh, uh, <laughs> we can have a private conversation here. This is very important, part, Brazilian part, courts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of it is we actually never actually learn from crises. We, you know, we, we say, let's, let's make more resilient the, the workout regime. Let us figure out far, how to put those firewalls in place. But there's an enormous amount of improvisation in dealing with financial crises, and part of the problem investors face when they see something that might create a financial crisis is you don't know exactly what officials will do. Well, that's the generation cream for financial commentators. Yeah. Roger has a question down here. You know, the, dog, <coughs> the dog that didn't bark is Europe. I mean, I realize that these commodity producers are a mess and China's got it, all these long-term, short-term challenges, but I think Europe's in a pretty bad mess right now, too. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called Brexit a couple of years ago, and now he's got a second edition, and he put him on television. Uh, and that's not the only stress and strain. Uh, what's happened in Polish uh, election is as worrisome as what's happened in Hungary over the last several years, and there's Putin still in Europe. Well, what do you think that... about Europe and the global outlook? Okay, so today was not only the uh, results of the Iowa caucus, also the uh, document which will probably frame the referendum in Britain on whether or not to leave the EU. I think that could actually be the populist vote, um, that of all the populist outbreaks around the world, if that went against EU membership, could have ripple effects that starts to unravel something really big. Um, but uh, who wants to comment on Europe and whether the... Um, I, I'll, I'll jump in and be the sort of naive optimist. Um, I was surprised that uh, Marie Le Pen didn't do better in the regional elections in France. Um, I, my observation about the European project is it actually makes progress when it's challenged. And I'm very mindful of the fact that the, um, the immigration issues are serious and going to be very hard to deal with. I was actually, I, um, second week in January, I was actually on a marketing trip through Europe, and one of the things that was sort of interesting is seeing how the Schengen system has evolved. Uh, at one point, I took a flight from Paris to Milan, and when we got off the plane in Milan, there were two policemen inside the jetway, between the jet and the terminal in Milan, that were checking passports. I had the most serious border check at immigration I've ever had going from Holland to Edinburgh. 
<laughs> right? And I literally, it was like 10 minutes with the person checking my passport and, at customs. And then I got through that and there was a plain clothes policeman on the other side who like asked me all those questions again. And I, so I'm, look, the Schengen system is sort of fraying at the, fraying at the edges. But I, look, I, I don't know how you look at what the Euro crisis has been without sort of concluding that the draw of it, the draw of European integration, is just incredibly powerful. And yeah, it's a crisis, and yeah, the growth is going to be weak, and I, you know, there are always, you know, a hundred obstacles to it. But it, in some ways, it, I, I'm just, I, I just look at the last three or four years, and I'm just struck by how remarkably resilient it is. Okay, I'm, I'm shopping for a pessimist here. I mean, Italy has yeah. been in recession for five of the last eight okay. years. Can I, can I, can I, can I offer? Yeah. Okay. Everyone thought Europe might break up on the single currency, dead wrong, because at the end of the day, the single currency is something controlled and shaped by the technocratic elites, the central bankers. What I find striking today in Europe is a depth of anger, real anger and soul-searching triggered inside Germany by the immigration crisis. Yes, maybe Merkel and the government can control this, but I look at my German friends, my decent, well-meaning, kind, there I say, liberal friends, and look at the scale of shock that they are feeling right now about what they receive as the fundamental attack on Germany. Um, and I think about how on earth they're going to control this crisis without resorting to a complete break of Schengen and then ask how on earth you keep the Eurozone, to get, or the Eurozone or Europe together in the face of that. It's possible it's going to be very tough. And for what it's worth, because that is basically not in the hands of technocratic elites, it's something which ordinary people are now getting sucked into in a way that was not the case with a single currency at all. And on Brexit, I think it's 50-50. Yeah. And most people, I mean, I was in London recently, most people I speak to there um, who are involved in the debate right now would put, it, put the odds somewhere around that as well. So I, I agree with Lewis in that the European project advances event by event, and that's because the event is a crisis and that allows the technocrats to advance things in a way that wouldn't actually stand up if you put it to an up or down vote on the electorate. Uh, and if you want a pessimist, then I think the, the, the three things to note is demographics are just terrible. Debt has accumulated and that will, will, will be a, a, a burden and limit uh, political choice going forward. And the zero lower bound we know is an attractor. It, you can get to it and it's hard to get off it. Can I, can I just say two things? One <laughs> is, um, the euro was a nitty-gritty issue for the Greeks, hmm. and they did get a chance to vote on it. Hmm. So yeah, at some level it was technocratic, but that got as personal for everyone as you can get, mm -hmm. and pushed to the limit, they voted to stay in. Second thing I would say about Germany, um, I think to me it matters a lot that the Chancellor of Germany is an East German. You forget that the Germans understand in some ways the issues about families that are sort of seeking a better life, trying to go to a different place, the difficulty choices that those things makes. And I get it. I mean, what happened in, you know, sort of what happened over the New Year's in Germany was a, is a real shock, and I'm sure it's generating a lot of tension. But I also think the Germans own experience with being divided and understand like what the choices, those choices made, it uh, gives me some hope that they're going to find a way around it. Look, as I said, I, I'm, I recognize I'm the kind of naive optimist here. <laughs> but I, I have to admit, in looking at the European project over, over 50 years, there have been any number of challenges that it's faced, and it has generally overcome them. And, I, you know, it's easy to, I, we, we have a, there's a typical problem we have on this side of the Atlantic, and it's, to some extent it's this side of the channel. Um, that it's hard to understand, hard to really appreciate the momentum behind it, and I'm continuing to be optimistic about it. It's weak growth and like the problem of recession. So the vote about the European project you should worry about is not the countries benefiting from access to a big market. It is the countries that are a backstop uh, in that big market. And they haven't, they haven't done the up and down vote. Wait, wait, sorry, what do you mean by that? I mean, i.e., the fact that Greece, the, the, the citizens of Greece see benefit associated with being in the euro area is not the same as 
the citizens of Germany wondering where their savings going? Well, well let's hope that Lewis is right. Time to, to wrap up, but I would just say that uh, we began with three uh, big sources of worry that seems to have been upsetting markets, uh, oil, China, and the Fed. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there are doubts whether either of the, any of those um, should really be taken as seriously as markets appear to have taken them. But uh, we've ended up with another issue which uh, maybe markets have been overlooking and they will be rearing their heads in the future and at another WEU uh, we'll be talking about that more. So thank you to Roger for the question. Thank you to the panel.